May I start? Uh, good morning to everybody. Welcome to everybody. On behalf of the Italian Chamber of Commerce, uh, I am Corrado Paina, I'm the Executive Director, and I thank you very much for joining us this morning for this new initiative, the, the True Italian Taste Project. From, nine, from 2016 till today, ECO has been committed, ECO and uh, Tiziana and Astrid in particular, have been has been committed to a guarantee to protect, to defend the authenticity, the traceability, the quality control and certification of authentic Italian food, with the goal of providing Canadian audiences the tools to make informed purchases and enjoy the unrivaled quality of genuine Italian goods. The True Italian Taste Project is promoted and financed by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, carried out by Asso Camerestero. Asso Camerestero is the umbrella organization of all the chambers. We are working with 36 chambers all over the world. Our network is comprised of uh, more than 70 chambers and 50 antennas, so-called, all over the world. So if you need information on any country on the planet, please uh, get in touch with me, with uh, Tiziana, with Astrid. Uh, we offer also a, a variety of uh, initiatives, such as educational tour, tasting events, lecture, master classes for the public, for media and influencer, and for industry representative. I really apologize for this long speech that Astrid has uh, so diligently written uh, for me. Thank you, I'm sorry. I just beg for your patience for another couple of minutes. We're starting today with Bon Appetito Vivalma, a series of master classes in collaboration with one of the most prestigious culinary school in Italy and internationally, Alma, close to Parma. Uh, Alma educates chefs and sommeliers from all around the world, forming professionals of Italian cuisine with training programs at the highest level, executed by world leading teachers. Alma has always promoted Italian agri-food heritage through high formation. The school commitment is to safeguard, protect, and disseminate Italian products in the world through its own teaching methods and through shared governance plans with international institutions and organizations. We are definitely very, very proud of having partnered with Alma for this series of masterclasses, since we both share the goals of promoting the authentic Italian food and wines, which pair perfectly with the local excellences and products from the farms to our table. Alma is located close to Parma, the outstanding little city, capital of culture and gastronomy, who gave birth to Arturo Toscanini, Bernardo Bertolucci and Roncolo di Busseto, a small town close to Parma, gave birth to the great Italian composer Giuseppe Verdi. It also gave birth to Prosciutto di Parma, il culatello di Zibello, il parmigiano reggiano, il salame di Felino, la spalla di San Secondo e i funghi di Borgo Taro. Parma is a real culinary deposit and it is the Italian province with the highest number of certified food products. Before introducing our chef for today, I would like to thank the participants who are connected via Zoom and also all of those who are following us via, via Facebook Live, including the students of the George Brown Culinary School and Centennial College School of Hospitality, Tourism and Culinary Arts. They are the future of the culinary industry in Canada and around the world. And we are happy to have them connected today and hopefully in the upcoming events as well. Thank you also to Italy Toronto, here represented by uh, Mattia Pagliara and Robert Wynn, the two chefs. Today, Chef Carlo Maria Ricci from Alma will tell us about the secrets of pasta. He's passionate about food from a very young age. Chef Carlo Maria Ricci is a two-time graduate of Alma. 
after a thorough formative series of international experiences, he currently shares time between his freelances consulting practice and working as an Alma chef ambassador. He believes in promoting Italian cuisine while spreading the culture and excellence behind Italian food and wine. Please take a look at the, the video about Alma, then Chef Richie will take the stage. Get ready to take notes and ask lots of questions. I, for what I understood, Astrid will coordinate, as usual, all these, uh, uh, the, all the questions. I want to praise Tiziana again and Astrid for their organization. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to have these great programs. Also, I want to thank Isabella for all the communication campaign that she has devotedly uh, uh, carried out. Thank you very much. And please for, forgive me and forget my face. Let's start. Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody. So first of all, let me thank uh, Executive Director Corrado Paina for the wonderful introduction, both of Alma, Parma and myself, um, and also everybody at the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Ontario who's been incredibly kind to organize and then um, uh, take care of all the technicalities that allow these um, events to happen. We are going to be uh, going through a little journey into the world of pasta today, where the aim of uh, the lesson or most of this meeting is to give you as much information as possible about the history, the structure of the actual product category, and some extra information about what makes it unique. Um, it's, uh, pasta is one of those products that it's uh, uh, very well known the world over. Uh, a lot of cultures have adopted pasta in their culinary practices, but you really have to refer back to Italy to understand where uh, it really comes from and what it's all about. So today, today we'll try to do just that. I will share my screen with you and we can get started right away. So, 
when we look at um, the history of pasta or a little timeline of the history of pasta, we really need to start talking about wheat uh, because obviously being its main ingredient, it's the, it's the, it's the one that makes it possible. Uh, about 8,000 years before the birth of Christ, wheat cultivation became uh, um, mainstream in the area that is now known as the Middle East. And this is really the starting point of uh, the journey of pasta into civilization. Uh, why? Because it's, uh, it really followed the, the history of every single main civilization that from the Middle East then spread through the Mediterranean. And being pasta, one of the main ingredients of Italian cuisine, and being Italian cuisine an important component of what is now uh, the UNESCO protected Mediterranean diet, we can really see this as being the stepping stone. Uh, wheat arrives in Rome, or what at the time was ancient Rome, through Greece, uh, thanks to the cultural exchanges that took place between these two civilizations. And it's really in ancient Rome that we start seeing the first documentations of pasta being a prominent ingredient in Italian cuisine, or at least in what will then become Italian cuisine. We don't really see it as the dry ingredient that we now know, but we see preparations that really resemble uh, current gnocchi take place. We see some stratified type of pasta, which are too early to be called lasagna, but definitely present. And we see something like dumplings is probably the best way to explain it which are part of what is the current pasta panorama in Italy as well. So it is in Rome that really pasta starts becoming part of culinary culture. Although uh, it is in the late or in the middle stages of the Middle Ages that pasta production really becomes an Italian phenomenon, especially in the region of Sicily. Um, a geographer called Mohammed al idrisi which was a very, in, it's a very interesting historical character, uh, uh, wrote a lot, of, excuse me, drew a lot of maps uh, of well, attendable maps of, at the time. And also he was um, one of those ge geographers that follow trade routes around the world. And he really documents Sicily being as being an epicenter of pasta production in Italy and in the Mediterranean to the point that pasta was already for uh, the Sicilian reign at the time, a commodity, so something to be exported. And in his diaries about trade in the Middle Ages, he actually points out, points, points pasta out as being uh, one of the biggest commodities traded from the south of Italy to the rest of the world. Although it is around the 17th century in Naples that we start seeing really for the first time a commercial production that really resembles what we can now recognize as dry pasta production. Why Naples? Uh, well, because to begin with, the, some areas around Naples have historically been great producers of durum wheat, even in Roman times, they were great producers of durum wheat. So they had the, 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 the main ingredient, the core ingredient to then be able to produce what is what was dry pasta, or what is the, uh, the, 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 um, the forefather of current dry pasta. Also, uh, the 17th century is when the first mechanical uh, processes entered pasta production. So we see the first mechanical mills for processing grains, uh, the first mechanical mills for pumping water. And uh, there are a few towns that really stand out, stood out for pasta production. And one of them, Garagnano, is very much an epicenter of pasta production to these days. And it is only in 1839 after tomato really became uh, an ingredient or a common ingredient in European cuisines that we have the first documented recipe for tomato pasta or pasta al pomodoro, which is kind of really the identifying uh, recipe for pasta around the world. It's kind of like the Trojan horse for pasta production, or for pasta recipes around the world. And a few years later, at the end of the 19th century, we really see pasta being produced and, excuse me, consumed throughout the country, although in very different ways. Uh, and by that, I mean, that it, this is the time where we can begin defining historically the different pasta classes, which is something we'll talk about today. And then later on in the 1900s, with the two big immigration waves from Italy to the rest of the world of Italians before and after World War II, we really see pasta uh, leaving Italy, entering other cultural realms and importantly other cuisines as well. As I said, pasta is one of those ingredients that culturally <laughs> has been adopted very, very easily. Obviously, to make pasta, we would need to start with a type of flour. 
and I say a type of flower because later on during the class or during the during our meeting, we will be uh, making an important distinction on the types of flower needed or that can be utilized to make faster production. So to begin with, we'll need a type of flower and then is some sort of liquid, which in some cases is eggs, some cases is water, some cases is a mix of the two. And at times, additional ingredients can be introduced as well. But basically, we'll need flour and a liquid to create a dough. Depending on the type of flour produced, here is where, excuse me, utilized, here is where pasta or the doughs that are obtained for pasta production will start taking different routes. And the routes that are taken are very much dependent on the type of dough that we're utilizing, so on the type of flour and liquid that we're utilizing, and also on the final results. And I say this because obviously pasta will need to be shaped, but egg pasta will follow a completely different shaping and extruding process when compared to the ones utilized for making dry pasta. Not only the flowers are different, but also the production processes are very different. So if, for example, to make egg pasta, we'll need simply, maybe we can get away with a rolling pin and a couple of cutters. To make dry pasta, we need a lot more, let's say, specific machine and also uh, a lot more intensive and uh, heavy machine machinery. So first distinctions come to mind or start begin happening. Then pasta can be stuffed and Fresh pasta, excuse me, stuffed pasta, it's traditionally always a fresh product. Or it can be leave, not it can be left non-stuffed, so simply shaped. And in this case, pasta can be both fresh and dry. And these distinctions are really important and must be kept in mind because the identity of stuff and non-stuffed pasta are very separate. Okay, so they are very much two different product classes. Um, Fresh stuff pasta can take many different shapes. It's always containing a sort of farce and the farce will be as functional to the final result as much as it is the shape of the pasta in question. So for example, large formats of stuff pasta will have milder, generally vegetable based or vegetable prominent type of farces. Uh, or maybe a, a very mild cheese could be utilized like for example ricotta. On the other hand, small shapes of pasta will always have very, very intense fillings, generally pre-processed, so maybe even pre-cooked, and uh, the, the intensity, the actual impact, flavor impact and mouthfeel of these stuffings is much, much greater. Uh, so let's imagine the difference between a tortellini, for example, like a tiny, tiny size uh, of um, a very small shape of stuffed pasta, which utilizes Parmigiano Reggiano, prosciutto di Parma, mortadella, uh, very, very um, uh, flavorful ingredients in its stuffing. So um, something that is going to provide a very important mouthful. And compared to maybe a spinach and ricotta tortelli, which is much bigger, much milder, we can, by looking at this product, really begin to see the differences that we're talking about. And in the case of staff pasta, as we said, it can be fresh or dry. And generally, fresh non staff pasta for the majority, okay, is made with egg pasta dough. Not always, but for the majority. And then dry pasta, as we know it, um, which always, 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 uh, this is a legal requirement, will have to be made with barren wheat flour. We'll spend some time later on talking about uh, the actual different types of uh, different pastas around the world, but we're actually going to look at the different types of wheat right now. This is because um, common wheat, as we know, so let's let's say bread making wheat or winter wheat, um, uh, excuse me, spring wheat. It's uh, the, the 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 most common wheat, maybe outside the Mediterranean basin, but definitely worldwide, and it's the one that is always utilized to make fresh and stuff pasta always. Um, why? Well, primarily because it has the right technical physical characteristics, but also uh, because traditionally it is grown or it was grown in the northern areas of Italy where the culture of fresh pasta really is prominent. And to this day, it is the northern regions of Italy that are very much the greatest producers of fresh pasta. When we move to the south of Italy, 
This is true right now, and it has been for quite a few centuries. The production of durum wheat is rampant. So it is, it is the preferred type of wheat, and durum wheat it is the preferred type of wheat to make dry pasta. They're very different from each other. One is white, one tends to have a, a, a more yellow color, color, excuse me, color, because as, um, uh, as it loses a few, let's say, genes, okay, it, it develops a couple of pigments. It is a less complex type of wheat. It is much sturdier, it is much harder, uh, but it is uh, that, that the lack of complexity in a way, genetic complexity, is made up by the addition of yellow pigments. So the reason why most, most uh, um, uh, commercial pasta tends to have this yellow tinge compared to, you know, pasta that is made with fresh common wheat without eggs. It is down to the actual pigments in the flour. When we then add eggs to common wheat, obviously we start developing this more yellow color in that type of dough as well. And this is an important distinction technologically, but as I said, also historically, really for the product itself, because they are distinctions that are made, that are born from the types of crops that were available in these two specific areas of the country. Dry pasta, as I said, fresh pasta is very easy to prepare. Uh, rolling pins or sheeter is all we need. But in the case of dry pasta, we'll need to rely on extrusion. And extrusion is a process where literally the pasta dough uh, very low, very, uh, of very low hydration. We're talking about 30% of water per kilo of flour. So a very hard dough is pressed through um, molds that give pasta its shape. This is a picture that is fairly explanatory of the actual process of dry pasta extrusion. And in extruding pasta, there are two main, uh, two main materials that are utilized to make the, um, the molds. One is Teflon, which is a type of polycarbonate or plastic, uh, which is preferred in industrial production. It produces a very uh, smooth pasta with a with a very uh, uh, distinctive glassy surface, okay? Uh, if you were to drop, uh, like for example, a, a penne made extruded in Teflon or polycarbonate on a, on, a, on a surface, you really hear that kind of glassy, almost plexiglass rem reminding uh, noise. It is not a bad thing uh, in any shape or form, it's just one way of doing it. But one thing that has to be pointed out is that Teflon doesn't really have uh, um, uh, chemi uh, physical characteristics that allow it to heat up. So uh, you, the, the, these molds will stay, will remain at a stable temperature throughout the extrusion process. They won't heat up either. So that the past, the past that one uh, would get is literally just an extrusion of the dough. But the more traditional way of extruding pasta is through bronze dyes, through, through, through bronze molds. And bronze has been the preferred uh, artisanal, uh, but in some cases also industrial, um, material for a few reasons. So first of all, it conducts heats very, very well. So when heating, um, when heating up through the production process, it will force starch that is trapped inside the dough to surface. Like it's a phenomenon called starch migration. So this starch will surface on the, uh, will literally move to the surface of pasta. It will, it will flourish a little bit. So it will leave a white coat and it also creates, it will also create a very, uh, a very coarse surface. So if you were to touch the surface or stroke the surface of a, of a shape of pasta that has been extruded through bronze, it will feel much, much coarser, uh, somewhat floury, somewhat grainy. And this is another important distinction to make right now because Teflon pasta will absorb sources and it will emulsify sources in a completely different way uh, when compared to bronze extruded pasta. And bronze extrusion will really be the more, uh, let's say culinary preferred way because uh, the, the, uh, the, the starch that is seeped into the water we're gonna be cooking pasta with, it's gonna be one of the binding agents for our final emulsion because pasta is really an emulsion of its sauce and pasta it is not just a product on top of which we're gonna put sauces. Uh, here you have a picture here really showing you the different uh, surface structures of a spaghetti extruded in Teflon and bronze. And I believe you will also um, receive some, some of these products to compare. So you'll be able really to see uh, by uh, a visual examination what we're talking about. A little bit of information to begin with, and I am ready to take the first few questions if you uh, so desire. 
Uh, thank you, Chef. Yes, we have um, a question. So is spring wheat all grown in the north and Durham in the south or are both grown all over Italy? So uh, the, primarily you will find to this day the distinction between north and south. The, and it, it is due to climatic conditions. Durham wheat requires uh, much more heat to, to grow properly. And the, the north of Italy grows a little bit of Durham wheat, but nowhere near as much as the south of Italy. Uh, and you maybe the, 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 the mixing of the two types you'll find in the center, but the distinction is very much pertinent to this day. Uh, thank you. I have another question as well. Um, can fresh pasta be made without egg? Uh, yes, absolutely. Fresh pasta can be made with water only. So there are some doughs that are called paste mate or crazy doughs uh, that are composed, that are, excuse me, that are made up of uh, flour and water or common flour and water. So that is something that can, can, can definitely happen, although they are very rare, uh, simply because uh, you would need to add some protein to uh, common flour in order to give it the tenacity to then uh, provide a type of pasta with enough mouthfeel to, 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 to appeal really to traditional ways of consumption. Um, and one other question, could you just give us uh, a brief explanation of the difference between durum wheat and normal wheat? Yes, for sure. So um, Durham wheat is uh, it enters the production process at different times. So it is um, it, it, it takes a little longer to grow. Uh, it is generally a sturdy plant. It can grow very, very high, very, very tall. Normal wheat will stand to remain a little bit lower. There are a lot of uh, easily identifiable strains of Durham wheat, which tells us that it's one of it's been in production. Uh, I wouldn't say longer, but with more favor com when compared to common wheat, especially in the Mediterranean basin. Um, Durham wheat is much harder, so sometimes it needs to be milled twice in order to get a fine consistency or in order to turn to provide a flour with a very fine consistency. And there is where the, the term semola rimacinata, so a, a twice milled uh, semola, it uh, comes from because it's uh, obviously much, much sturdier. Uh, that said, there is much more genetic variation in common wheat. So you will find very weak, very strong common wheats, but in the case of the arm wheat, you will find that protein contents vary, but not as much. Um, and before we go on with the second part, there's just a follow-up question. Uh, what about freezing? Does fresh spring wheat and durum wheat freeze the same? Uh, so the actual wheat, uh, they shouldn't really be frozen, uh, the wheat themselves or the grain. Uh, you can freeze egg pasta dough very easily and you can also freeze durum wheat pasta dough. Uh, but if you were to freeze durum pasta dough, uh, so um, pasta dough made with durum wheat, you would have to make sure that the water content is a little bit higher than usual so that the pasta would be a little bit stickier. But don't, don't freeze the grain, but you can freeze the, the final product, almost so the fresh pastas made with both wheats. Okay, thank you, Chef. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, there will be opportunities later on to ask more questions. So I would ask you now to continue with the second part. Thank you very much, Astrid. Let's do it. So um, we've, we've spoken about already a little bit about the distinction between the north and the south as far as wheat production goes, but there are also uh, very important distinctions to be made when it comes to the ingredients that actually make up the dough. This is because the north of Italy is very much the part of the country that is known to this day for the production of egg pasta sometimes even a lot of eggs. And by that I mean that it isn't uncommon to find recipes that only utilize the yolk of the egg. So very rich, uh, very rich doughs that are intended for very specific purposes. The center of Italy, uh, and this we've, we've, we've covered a little bit by answering one of the questions, is a bit of a hybrid area. We find, we find mostly wheat flour, uh, common wheat flour. Sometimes we find that we find eggs entering the production process, but we see very much a production of fresh pastas with uh, water and flour only. And it is only when we get to the south of Italy that Durham wheat takes center stage and the production of pasta is based on very hard doughs made with water only. And uh, there is also a regional distribution of, um, of very much a dividing line between the north and the south for when it comes down to stuffed and non-stuffed pasta. This is because the south of Italy very much is the place where non-stuffed pasta 
belongs to or more so is the part of the country where you will only find non-stat pasta. There are technical and mostly um, hygienic reasons related to this. Uh, Durham wheat is a very strong, in a way, uh, is a very strong wheat, it provides very strong doughs that are not particularly extensible, they're not particularly elastic. To have the elasticity and extensibility, you would need those made, those made with uh, common wheat and eggs because eggs add a lot of elasticity to the dough. So to actually technically make stuffed pasta, sometimes to fold it, to close it, to twist it off itself, you need the extensibility. But also, apart from growing Durham wheat, the south of Italy, it's an area where climatic conditions are fairly a Mediterranean with a tendency towards being warmer than the north. So uh, stuffed pasta would kind of suffer uh, and could lead to you know, complications down the line. When we look at the realm of stuffed pastas or some of the most exemplary stuffed pasta within, within the Italian realm, apart from finding them Oops, pardon me, excuse me. Uh, finding them all in the north of Italy, except for um, a few preparations in the island of Sardinia, um, we, we noticed that uh, different names really refer to different shapes. And there are very good reasons for this. Although sometimes we find shapes that are slightly similar for a reason or another, or resemble each other, resemble each other a little bit. And sometimes we also find uh, names that kind of are resounding of other preparations or other fresh pasta preparation. But it is essential to point out that every single recipe for fresh pasta will really produce or really yield the product that is different from another. Um, don't quote me on the exact number, but there are about uh, between 170 and 190 traditional shapes of fresh pasta, stuffed fresh pasta, and all of them are very much unique in their own. So if we were to look at this, um, at this slide, for example, we see that we have a capellacci on the right hand side and then a capelletti. Uh, they are, one is a majority, so capellacci means big hat or big ugly hat in a way, and capelletti means little hat, uh, simply because there is a little bit of resemblance uh, from these shapes uh, to, um, to, the, to a hat, to actually the shape of a, a real hat. But they are, uh, apart from being from different towns, they are very different from each other. This is because capellacci is a very large, port, large format of stuffed pasta, always stuffed with pumpkin, uh, a, a mild vegetable that even when roasted remains mild, obviously complex for what it is, but nothing in common with the stuffing of capelletti, which uh, again can have uh, parmigiano reggiano, um, prosciutto di parma, mortadella, and, and, and so on. So the size will be different and the utilization will be profoundly different as well. Um, Capelletti share uh, a lot of ingredients in, in their filling with tortellini and anolini, but they yield from different towns. They are part of very different cultural, uh, cultural habits or consumption habits, very different regional cuisines. So uh, again, they are very much products in their own good, as are, for example, culurgiones, which are um, a uniquely shaped pasta for the Italian, for the Italian fresh pasta, fresh stuff pasta realm. They're fairly big. Um, they are one of the very few recipes in Italy that uh, uh, accept mint as part of the filling. Very typical to Sardinia. Uh, they utilize a little bit of fat in the dough, sometimes lard, sometimes extra virgin olive oil, no eggs, soft wheat. So they really stand out. And, um, the, all these differences are just examples of how much things can change from one region to another and from one pasta recipe to another. And if we were to take chalsons, for example, which are in the top right of the picture, uh, apart from being uh, the most uh, free pasta stuff pasta when it comes to shape, because there are a lot of different shapes that are accepted for this recipe called chalsons, uh, they are uh, unique in a way that they utilize a lot of spices simply because this part of the country was on the spice trade. Uh, and also they are one of the very few recipes that calls for uh, almost a sweet stuffing. You know, there's a, there's a predominance of kinds of jams of, of, of dried fruits that enter the, uh, the, 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 the recipe list. So they're, again, unique in their own kind. And even if we don't have uh, the stuffings to uh, separate or identify 
non-staff pasta as different from one another, here is where the shapes of pasta really come into play. So different shapes uh, dictate the identity of the non-staff pasta we're looking at. And also, uh, we've said this before, non-staff pasta can be made both with fresh and uh, dry pasta. So apart from shapes, different shapes, you'll find also a lot of different identities when it comes to utilization. Um, Pichi, uh, for as much as they resemble spaghetti, uh, they have very little in common with spaghetti. So first of all, they don't use durum wheat. Uh, they're made with common wheat. They're very, very big. It's a very large size of spaghetti. Uh, I'm talking about maybe four to five times the thickness of normal spaghetti. They're typical from Tuscany. They have some very specific sauces that they are traditionally served with, and you'll only really find them in, in this part of the country. Uh, and the same, in a way, it's true for trofie from Liguria. So trofie are the pasta that uh, uh, in, in this part of the country, it is utilized or is the main choice uh, when making pasta with pesto. So when you're thinking about pasta with pesto, really think about trofie with pesto. And um, th the same is true for all other pasta formats on this list. And what is very interesting is that if staff pasta had uh, let's say um, stuffings of choice, all non stuff pasta, whether it's dry or fresh, will have in a way sources of choice. And this choice is dictated by tradition. So, local traditions that um, chose or even developed these shapes of pasta regarding uh, in, accord or in accordance with the local ingredients and which then turned into recipes. So tagliatelle are the, 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 the pasta of choice for making ragù alla bolognese, trofie are the, choice, the, cho the chosen pasta to make pesto alla genovese, orecchiette um, are the chosen pasta to make, you know, orecchiette with cime di rapa, so to use colored greens in, in pasta sauces and so on. Um, and this is very, very important uh, because there are lots of different sizes of pasta, lot, especially when it comes to non staff pasta. We really have uh, a very uh, a staggering amount of different shapes, over 300, okay, of which at the moment over 200 are produced. And it is uh, surprising to say that most, not all of them, but most of this pasta have very specific traditional uses. Um, and by that I mean that they really marry in our collective culinary subconscious, if we could say, uh, with specific sources. And other, any other questions, Astrid, that we could answer? Uh, yes, chef. Uh, we have received a couple of questions. So the first one, uh, do most Italian chefs stay true to their region? Would a southern Michelin star chef only make Durham unstuffed pasta in their restaurant? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it, it really varies. So, um, and by that I mean that there are obviously very traditional restaurants and also recipes and also chefs that really tend to stick with tradition or at least they will favor traditional formats and traditional doughs. But, you know, it is 2020, uh, there are, you know, modern cooking, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very much an affair of creativity and creation. So there are a lot of hybridizations. For example, if you were to go to the south of Italy, you would find now, especially in, uh, in, in, in specific restaurants, but not only, pastas that are stuffed, for example. Uh, maybe those chefs will choose to add a little bit of darum wheat to the dough, maybe not. So, and if you were to go to the north of Italy, you'll definitely find a uh, great utilization of dry pasta. So th there are boundaries, but also, you know, there is very much the creative process. Although, uh, and I say this again, I want to stress it, it is still uh, eating or searching or hunting for the, for example, the, the, the best tortellini. It is very much an affair that has to be taken place, that has to be done in the region of Emilia Romagna, if not in the town of Bologna, because there is, a, there is definitely a lot of attention given to traditional products and traditional cuisines. Uh, there's actually another question that goes well with this one. So what might be the reason why some pastas are better known or become mainstream versus others? Uh, for example, are they related to certain regions having stronger trade relations or marketing? Uh, the versatility, does that make a difference? Um, I'd say yes, absolutely. There is a little bit of that. Uh, the, 
there are a lot of historical reasons linked to the actual immigration waves that we were talking about. So it's very easy to identify uh, how, for example, spaghetti got to the States, or it's very easy to, to identify why pesto is so, uh, uh, so much appreciated around the world, or why it became so versatile. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's also very much down to taste. And um, taste and technique. Some sauces, some pastas, some preparations are easier than other, uh, and also are more, in a way, approachable, fulfilling, pleasant, pleasurable uh, than others, so they become just a general favorite. Uh, and uh, another reason is very much there are some aspects of traditional regional Italian cuisines that are very, to this day, um, very much undiscovered, even for Italian chefs. It is not uncommon that a chef from the north of Italy or, for example, one of the south of Italy uh, would know, would have a very good idea of what is happening in the north or the south. Uh, respectively of where they're from, but maybe there are still recipes that he's not aware of, maybe there are still products that he's not aware of, or nuances within those cuisines that he's not aware of, because it's such a broad, uh, broad, uh, broad subject, it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint. And uh, one more question before we go on to the third part. Um, is it true that dry pasta is more digestible if cooked al dente rather than if cooked for a longer time? Um, I, I don't know uh, about the more digestible, but it is scientifically proven that it has a lower uh, glycemic index. Um, okay, thank you. I think for now we can move on to the last part and uh, do uh, any more questions that are coming in. We can take care of them at the end. Excellent. So um, here we are. So uh, when we look at um, the Italian pasta realm, within the context of certification seals, so within the context of PDI and PGO seals, uh, which uh, I will just quickly clarify what they are once again. So the European Union, um, after World War II, decided to uh, implement a system of uh, protecting traditional products and preparations that were very much produced still adhering to culinary traditions, local culinary traditions. Uh, Italy has a, a very, excuse me, Italy has a very interesting uh, history or very interesting um, uh, record to be claimed in that case because they are the country in the world with the highest number of certified pastas. Most of them are fruit and vegetables. There are a lot of obviously cheeses, cold cuts and whatnot, but there are also five pastas and there are from all over the country. So uh, we, we, do, we do find pastas from the south of Italy, but we also find pastas very much from the north, like the deepest north of Italy. They're different, very different from each other. Uh, Pizzo curry uh, are made with um, uh, buckwheat and they are um, very typical of this one valley of Lombardia, always served with local cheese, char, excuse me, cabbage and uh, uh, local cheese and cabbage. Um, you really won't find them anywhere else. This is where you would have to go. And the same is true for the Kulu Johnny's that we spoke about, this uniquely stuffed um, uh, pasta from Sardinia. The same is true for Cappellacci, this great, big, big format of pasta made with pumpkins and amaretti, uh, which are themselves a PGI product. Um, so there, there is a lot to be said when it comes to certification and when it, when it comes to certification seals and when it comes to Italian pasta. Um, and there is one product in the specific we really want to talk about purely because it's the most uh, 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 exemplary one or the, the, the best example that we can bring up when we talk about pasta. And I say this because the pasta di Gagnano PGI, it's really the only certified dry pasta as we know it. So when we think about dry pasta, we all have very clear in our minds uh, the, the, the idea of pasta made with durum wheat, then dried and then packaged with a very long shelf life because this drying process uh, allows for a shelf life that can go up to three years. Uh, and pasta di Gagnano PGI is really the product that spans from the region where traditional or mechanical pasta production was first implemented, it spans from a town that has been producing pastas for a, a ridiculous amount of, 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 of centuries, uh, exactly the same way it's always produced. And it is really called the town of pasta. So if you were to go to Garniano and you were to go to the main road, which is called Via Roma, uh, which uh, uh, 
cuts the town from north to south, basically. I'm not sure if it's north to south, really, but it's basically one part of the, the, the upper part of the town will point to the Vesuvius and the lower part of the town will point to the sea. And this town, this strait has a fantastic air movement. So if you were to go there in the morning, you would feel the sea coming up from the air. And if you were to, if you were to go there in the evening, you will feel the, you know, the inversion called the, the air inversion, so cold air coming down from the Vesuvius. And this constant air movement was ideal for drying pasta. So traditionally, dry pasta wasn't dried in uh, warehouses or with uh, with uh, with mechanized system with air conditioning. It was dried very much on the street. And um, Gragnano had the perfect conditions for this to take place. So dry pasta from Gragnano, it's very much part of local tradition and local local folklore to the point that I think this is a town of 30,000 people. And to this day, about 90% of 90% of them are still employed in the production of pasta. It is only made with darum wheat, like all dry pasta. And to this day, it's made utilizing local water. And um, it will always, on the packages, I don't know if you can see my camera. On the packages of Pasta di Gragnano, you will always find the seal, the certification seal of the consortium, and the PGI seal that uh, certifies it as just that, you know, a PGI protected pasta. And um, it's, um, it is an area that it is, it is very fortunate as far as pasta production comes. And this has been true for millennia, down to Roman times, to the point that the area around Gragnano was called the wheat basket of Rome, even in Roman times. So um, these products are perfectly embedded into local cultures, perfectly embedded into local geography. And um, with the product being a PGI, which stands for protected geographical indication, uh, we know uh, that the product is everything that is concerned with production and drying and packaging of this pasta takes place locally, although there is an allowance for Durham wheat to come from outside the PGI area, so from outside the town of Gragnano, simply because there is so much pasta produced that obviously some of it will have to be brought in from somewhere. And um, I believe in your in your in your basket, in your food basket, you you will receive a package of pasta di Gagnano and you'll be really, uh, you really be able to tell the difference uh, when it comes down to mouthfeel, especially if you would cook it al dente and especially if you were to emulsify the sauce well with the pasta, because this is a type of pasta that will really draw on a lot of sauce. But most importantly, really concentrate on the flavor because it is unlike any other pasta, not so much because it is made with local water, but because the drying process is incredibly slow. And when slowly drying starch, the structure of the starch of this starch modifies to the point that it will literally provide more mouthfeel. So a unique product in itself, really, really wonderful. And how do we cook pasta? I know this sounds really silly, but we're going to spend a little bit talking about this because there are a few uh, specific steps that we want to make sure that we always respect so we always follow so uh whether we use water or broth we need to make sure that it's boiling before we put um our pasta in this is because starch uh, starts gelifying above 90 degrees so we really need the temperature to begin the cooking process of starch so we don't want to hydrate it only we also want to cook it and we also need to make sure that the pasta is always fully submerged and I say broth because sometimes uh, pasta will be cooked in broth, and if it is cooked in broth, it's always served in broth itself. So after the correct cooking time, and this is something that is down to preference, Italians really prefer pasta to be al dente. Uh, pasta is either served, as I said, in the broth that is cooked in, or it can be separated from the cooking liquid, so it can be dried. And Italian, and literally, the term for this type of pasta is pasta asciutta, dry pasta, separated from its water. And from there on, it can take two different routes when it comes to condiments. The condiment can be stratified, like in the case of lasagna, or sometimes some baked type of pastas, or it can be mixed with the pasta itself. There are an immense amount of recipes when it comes to sauces that can go with pasta. So really pick and choose, like there's a lot to, to, to fit anybody's fancy. But the most important thing to say is that sometimes as with 
everything in Italian cuisine, simplicity is the key. So it isn't unusual that pasta can be simply dressed with oil, butter, and a type of cheese. This is something very common in, in a lot of Italian households and sometimes even in some Italian restaurants. So um, this is an important point to highlight. And Italians are obviously great eaters of pasta, great consumers of pasta. To this day, the majority of the country will consume pastas five times a week. Mostly males will consume pasta five times a week and mostly males from the south of Italy. There is, at least in Italy, a preference for short grooved pasta. Um, and this comes a little bit as a surprise for most, especially outside of Italy where spaghetti seems to be seem to be the, the pasta that is uh, that inhabits everybody's Im 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 imaginary or imagination when it comes to, to Italy. You know, mob, from mobster movies to uh, the Lady in the Tramp, spaghetti has always been the pasta of choice. But really, there are a lot of short formats of pasta that are preferred. And at the moment, there is a great attention towards uh, whole wheat products. So we start seeing whole wheat pasta really uh, gain more and more share uh, shelf, shelf real estate and share in supermarkets. Although regardless of the format that is chosen, pasta has to be cooked al dente for Italians. They really like this, uh, this bite provided by uh, pasta that is cooked al dente. The, there are a lot of recipes. Some of them though really are more, uh, more uh, famous or more, I rather preferred over others. So lasagna is the type of pasta that is, one of the types of pasta that is consumed really throughout Italy, many different forms, as it is tomato pasta, pasta pomodoro, as it is carbonara, this beautiful recipe, very rich, very indulging pasta recipe for Rome. But regardless of the recipe chosen or the, 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 the format chosen, really uh, Italians still to this day adhere to uh, traditional values that really highlight simplicity as one of the main or one of the most important characteristics in pasta consumption. So pasta has to really still stick to tradition. The Italians are very, very, very fond of that. Um, as we said, it's a very versatile product and um, slowly Italians are realizing that there are a lot of different ways to use pasta, but they are kind of more acknowledging them than uh, putting them to use. Um, so all the pasta recipes from around the world are still something that we look at, <laughs> if one so could say, instead of consume. Uh, this was uh, the last slide of a very intense <laughs> and fast and information packed uh, pasta journey. So uh, if you so wish, I will be more than happy to answer more questions again. Uh, thank you, Chef. Yes, we have um, a few questions. Um, so out of all the types of pasta that there are in Italy, why are there only five that have the PGI seal? A very good question. So um, in order to achieve um, or uh, be able to uh, obtain a seal of certification, some sort of um, um, collective movement has to take place. And by that I mean the... Um, uh, a body or a group of people will really have to take this, uh, this, this, uh, the cause, this cause or a specific cause at heart and choose to promote it. Uh, because, and so, for example, if you wanted to um, uh, get a PGI approval for uh, a pasta from Parma, a specific pasta from Parma, we would really need to get together. And before going to the European Union asking for recognition, we would have to codify these products, these processes ourselves. So we all have to agree that uh, uh, this is the uh, these are the correct ingredients. Uh, there is a correct way of making it. To this day, we have a production of this pasta that is true to tradition. So we can trace it back in time, we can document it, we can officially do so. And then we'll have to go to the European Union and ask for certification. So um, while there are a lot of pastas that are very traditional, this has happened so only at the moment in five cases. Uh, and th they are uh, notable examples, but there's definitely space for more. Um, it, it is uh, down to um, uh, pr uh, anybody who wants to uh, kind of raise the case with the European Union and try to get a pasta approved to, to do so. Uh, there are only five certified pastas of the carrier seal, but there are a lot of traditional pastas that are recognized as such by the Italian government uh, under the PAT program, so uh, um, which basically is a product that certifies authenticity. 
So yes, there are only five uh, in that list, but if you were to refer to other lists, then there'll be a lot more traditional products. Uh, and just more specifically for the pasta di Gragnano, the PGI is based on the actual dough versus the shape of the pasta? Uh, it is uh, the PGI uh, um, certification kind of document certifies the type of wheat utilized, the type of water utilized, the production processes. So I, I mean the extrusion and drying process. And it also uh, points out that there are, while there are specific formats that are recognized as pasta di Gognano, others can, on, can, all, can also be uh, recognized as such if produced in a specific way. So currently there are about 50 formats that are produced all very traditional, but if we wanted to, to um, for example, produce a different type of format uh, or a new type of format and certify this pasta di Gagnano, we would have to follow the very specific production process. But uh, that said, the technical limitations of the, especially of the drying process itself, limit the types of pasta that can, 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 that can be produced that way. So they'll have to be very uniform in shape, very uniform in size, uh, especially when we come to thickness and they don't have to be too thick. Um, you don't want a concentration in one point and then dispersion in another. So they'll have to be fairly uniform and that's why there are only 50 produced at the moment. Um, and the next question uh, is if there is any sauces that are certified. Uh, there aren't any sauces that are certified as such. There are a lot of sauces that are because the certifications tend to uh, be more something that it's uh, related to products. Uh, but there are some ingredients that then are part of sauces that are very much certified. So in the case of pesto, there is a specific type of basil from Genoa that is uh, a protected product. Um, there are, uh, um, for example, specific vegetables that enter traditional sources, per the traditional cold cuts that enter traditional sources, uh, traditional cheese, excuse me, protected cheeses that enter traditional sources. And once again, uh, the PGI and PDO list is one place to look at when looking at traditional recipes, but the PAT list uh, issued by the, the Italian government is the one where you'll find a lot more of traditional, a lot more traditional recipes that uh, are, uh, let's say, one step away from becoming certified. Um, and we also have a couple of questions on salting the water when you cook mm -hmm. pasta. So the rule of thumb, I think, is um, you salt it after boiling. Uh, so, why, why is that? Uh, well, the addition of salt itself so increases, like slightly raises the boiling point of pasta for just a brief amount of time. So um, while the salt is dissolving, the boiling point, so the boiling, excuse me, lower is the boiling point of pasta would be of the water will be a little bit lower before the salt actually saturates the water. So um, if you are to get the pasta to bo its boiling point, adding the salt, allowing the salt to dissolve and then adding the pasta, technically you will keep uh, the water as close as possible to its boiling point. So you will keep it in the 90 degrees, 90 degrees Celsius range where starch will begin, will begin jellifying right away. So it's uh, the, the correct procedure is very much boiling water, salt, uh, vigorous boil, addition of pasta, and then um, allowing it to cook. That said, you want to use the right amount of water per salt per quantity of pasta. So uh, there are different ratios that kind of come into play. Uh, it is generally said that 100 grams fit well with uh, 10 grams of salt and a liter of water, but some people prefer to use a lot more than that. And by a lot more, I mean a lot more water, so abundant water. Okay, thank you. I have two more questions before we um, finish. Uh, so do you have any suggestions on how to make gluten-free dough? Which flour uh, would work best? Well, that's a very good question. So making gluten-free dough is very, very tricky because uh, you would need to um, uh, stimulate the gelification of starch before, uh, before uh, the, um, the cooking process. So ideally you would have to cook, shape and recook. So um, Technically, in the kitchen, it's very, very hard to make gluten-free dough. It is possible to use alternative flours and eggs um, in case uh, those are welcome. Uh, 
so for example, uh, rice flour with, with yolks works or specific type of starches with yolk, but it's really, uh, it's really, really tricky. So for example, if you look at the production process of egg, oh, excuse me, of rice noodles, it's, it is incredibly time consuming and the actual jellification of, um, of the starch, it occurs through cooking. So these are those that are cooked, uh, kind of extruded or, or uh, reworked and then extruded and then cooked again. So it's, uh, it's tricky, it's very tricky. Um, and uh, one last question, um, is any of the wheat used to make pasta genetically modified? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know for sure. I would say, considering the current panorama, for sure there will be there will be GM 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 flowers entering the production process. But in the case of certified pastas, and also in the case of uh, of Italian producers, this is something that is avoided. Uh, more so, um, uh, we are entering kind of like a um, a realm that it's uh, uh, you know with the, 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 the there is a thin red line between modified and non-modified telling us what is modified and non-modified especially in the recognition on the consumer side so uh, there might be there might be not it's very hard to tell but i would say uh, and these are my words that probably some will be there um okay thank you i don't have any more questions on my side you're very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Astrid. I will now uh, pass the word back to Executive Director Paina, and thank you very much to everybody for listening. Thank you very much, Chef Carlo Maria Rich. I actually have a question for you. Did you ever read the book called Così parlò Bella Vista by De Crescenzo? I can't say I did, no. Uh, that book says that human beings are divided in two categories human beings of love and human beings of freedom. And people that love freedom take showers. People that love, people that love love take hot bath. I was wondering if you can apply the same category for pasta. People that love love eat spaghetti and people that need, that are, you know, love freedom tend to eat short pasta. I'm a bimillennial, bi but I prefer short pasta, I have to say. I'm a man of fast decision, quite uh, active. But I was wondering. Um, I would definitely say that those who love freedom would choose spaghetti for sure. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's such an Italian pasta, you know, it's, it seems so composed and then you start eating and it turns into a mess. So <laughs> I'd say uh, the, 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 the feeling of freedom is definitely, definitely linked to consumption of spaghetti for me. I would say that for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for your outstanding presentation, really extremely informative, extremely interesting. And thank also to the chef from Italy, you know, uh, Mattia Pagliara and Roberto Wynn. Thank you very much. Thank to everybody. And uh, just a reminder, a quick reminder, uh, probably in these months, a lot of people approached you asking to taste their bread because a lot of people are challenging themselves and they're making bread. Sometimes we're forced to eat the worst bread ever, but sometimes we eat actually some good bread. Uh, next Tuesday, uh, the next Alma uh, Masterclass will be about making bread, and it will be from 11 a.m. to 12 a.m. I want to thank everybody, and in particular Astrid, Tiziana, and Isabella. Uh, let's get together the next Tuesday, and thank you again. Bye-bye.